Seems like old times Having you to walk with Just like old times Having you to talk with Before I uh, introduce our distinguished guest speaker, I would like to uh, have this. Um, in 1630, when Governor Winthrop of Massachusetts when the first governor of Massachusetts arrived in Boston uh, in 1630, he set his eyes on the beautiful uh, land of what we now call Winthrop, and he fell in love with it. In 1631, he asked his dear friend, Captain William Pierce, to go to England and pick up his wife, Margaret Tyndall. So Captain Pierce went over and brought her back, and um, Captain... Uh, not only was Captain Pierce one of the most esteemed sailors of the New World, he crossed the Atlantic more times than any other sailor in the day. Uh, Captain Pierce made uh, nine journeys on the Mayflower bringing colonists to Plymouth. Uh, Pierce uh, took the Freeman's Oath to be a selectman for Governor Winthrop. And in 1636, Pierce had a brand new ship built at Marblehead called Desire. Um, in 1637, he was one of the 15 men that was given a portion of land in Boston called Pullen Point, which got its name because an ox was needed to pull a fishing boat around the point. That's right by Deer Island. Uh, this notorious sea captain very carefully picked out the best location to build on his 100-acre oceanfront property. The house had to be close to a safe harbor. It had to be protected from the northeast winds, faced perfectly south to maximize the sunlight, and it had to be a dry spot from the wettest days of the year at the bottom of a hill. This celebrated sailor had the best carpenters of the day on board his ship. He needed the best skilled men to repair a broken mast or a leaky hull. The cooper, who was skilled at making barrels, holding food supplies, grog, beer, and lemon juice, was the, ship, was the best shipwright on board. And he was treated with more respect and had better living quarters that were close to that of the captain. As part of the great allotment, Captain Pierce had one year to build a home on the farmland or it would go to someone else. In 1637, Captain Pierce and his shipmates built this two-story home for his wife Bridget and his son William. In 1639, Captain William Pierce published the first book in the colonies, the New England Almanac which gave in detail the layout of the new land, the types of trees, rocks, fish, birds, ocean depths, charts, and Indian names. So one might be able to assume that Captain William Pierce put his final touches on the almanac, sitting right here beside a warm fire on these grounds. Which is quite amazing to think about. The first book was Almanac, probably written partially here. At this time, I'm going to turn my attention to someone else who has been one of the most best navigators of our hometown, one who has given countless hours to our community, given thousands and thousands of Winthrop High School and middle school students tours of this old house. He's written many checks as treasurer for the Weha High School uh, Scholarship and has written a children's educational book about the history of the Winthrop Old Narrow Gauge Train. He wrote two map books and he has two books in the work works right now for educational purposes. He has written hundreds and hundreds of articles for the Winthrop Transcript that uh, we all go right to when we open up the transcript. 
He was the town government moderator for years, and he's named the official town historian. He also raised five wonderful children with his wife, Claire, who is the most precious person that I know. Six. Six, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so Claire was the first female president of Weehaw. So congratulations on that, Claire. Yeah. What a team needs to be made. Yeah. Um, it's truly my honor to introduce a person that's given so much life to our tiny little town. Ladies and gentlemen, the Winthrop Town Historian, Mr. Dave Hubbard. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, what I'm going to do is tell you the history of the Dean Winthrop House. And we have a young lady here who's going to show us pictures. They may not be uh, compatible with what I'm saying, but it's their pictures of the old house, so we never really had a chance to piece it. The way I'm going to do this is I have written a number of years ago a history of the Dean Winthrop House and I'm just going to, going to read it to you and if you got questions as we go along feel free to raise your hand, yell or whatever you want and uh, we'll try and answer them. As residents of Winthrop and members of the Winthrop Improvement Historical Association we are fortunate to be the owners of the oldest wood frame house in the entire United States that has been continuously lived in. There are two or three other houses that are a couple of years older, south of here, but they have not always been lived in. We have just finished researching and now have a list of all of the residents of the house from 1637 to date. To begin with, what was our peninsula like prior to 1635, and why did the colonists develop the desire to begin to move here? As Boston grew in the early 1630s, the area now known as the Boston Common was used to graze their flocks, cattle, and sheep. As time progressed, the area became overcrowded, so they looked across the harbor toward our peninsula and saw green pasture land, lightly treed, surrounded by water with only a narrow connection to what is now Beachmont. It had flats of salt water, hay growing, and an abnormal, I'm sorry, an aboriginally trail from Revere to what is now Point Shirley, which is still in existence in our present Revere and Shirley streets. Before 1630, the Indians who summered here from Mount Malden and Melrose planted their gardens in the spring using corn as a centerpiece with beans, tomatoes, and pumpkins growing around it which they returned to in the fall to harvest in reverse. They summered here, caught fish, played games, and a <coughs> The first Bostonian to come here was William Cheeseborough, who with an Irish bondsman built a small cabin somewhere near where the coming school is today, which is kind of in the center of winter. And it's by an area which used to be called the Pit. I don't know if I'm familiar to any of you now, but it was an area called the Pit and then cared for the Boston herds that might be brought here. They built a fence of logs, tree trip, light limbs, and brush across the sandy area between Winthrop and Revere to keep the cattle in and to keep the wolves out. In 1637 to 38, Governor John Winthrop divided our peninsula into 17 parcels of land and gave them to 15 prominent men for homesteading i.e. they had to build some sort of a living facility, but house, uh, an Indian lodge for poles within two years or lose their land. In 1638, Anne Hutchinson, a religious student, was banished to Rhode Island and many of her followers were among the 15 Pullen Point landowners who then sold out to other landowners or just abandoned the land. If you take a look at this 1690 map, 
along with the four houses, uh, the Bills, the house, four houses were the Bills House on Johnson Avenue, Winthrop's House on Shirley Street, which we're next to right now, the Gibbons Elm, or the, which was next to the Gibbons Elm, the Gibbons House on Washington Avenue, and the Oliver's House on Beale Street. C1911 map, still showing the same four houses in three dimensions before the 1753 fishing industry began at Port Shirley. C, the 1806 map, still showing the same four houses north of Cottage Hill and Point Shirley fishing village houses. The salt works commenced about 1811 and in 1839 the first bridge to East Boston was built, where the one is today. As to the construction of the Dean Winthrop House, there have been many speculative scenarios surrounding the sequence of events that describe the construction of this house, based on numerous descriptions by many people, all of which were studied by Professor Adam Cummings of the University of Massachusetts School of Architecture a number of years ago. The, number, the following appears to best describe how it evolved into the house today in 1637. Captain William Pierce built a small round frame two-story house of which the second story was a small balcony reached by a ladder from the living room where the children slept. On this site, similar to the ones today, on display at the Plymouth Plantation, it was set on a low stone foundation with a chimney on the westerly side, which was located on the present site of our current large five fire fireplace chimney. When Dean Winthrop took over the house in 1641, he probably added a small addition to the western side of the chimney. We know that the current large two-story western side of the chimney house was built in 1675 based on a technological study we had performed in 18, I'm sorry, in 1997. Then based on the same study, the 1695 two-story eastern side of the house was built and looked out, looking out the attic one will see that there is no ridge pole along the great peak of the roof, which was, was normal prior to 1700. Also the attic, in the attic there is an evidence of two dormer windows having been in front slope of the roof overlooking Shirley Street. Judge Sewell wrote a document detailing the 1698 wedding of Dean's daughter Mary to Arthington Howe in which he noted a couple of things pertaining to the original house. Some parts of the early house remained, such as the 28-inch wide floorboard and the first floor hall. At that time, any board over 24 inches long had to, by law, be sent to England for use in their building activity. There were, are some of the high, the high doors, hinges, that are still in the house. The basement was enlarged to be under the entire house of what some prob, prob, of what time probably as part as 1675 and 1695 editions. When the house was sold by the Winthrop's in 1720, further major changes appeared to have occurred. The large lean-to addition to the rear of the house, which houses the milking birthing room and the rear kitchen and dining area, and a small wood storage area, now used as the kitchen, were added in 1754. The entire structure was then raised and current stone foundation built under the complete house, which was then lowered onto it. This is an amazing foundation considering that the floor is dirt, and while it is just below sea level at high tide, there is no evidence of water ever coming up through it. The original small cluster of four flues and fireplaces was replaced with a huge five flue fireplace arrangement at the current chimney that surrounds the secret chamber, two floors long and highly accessible, all of which is mounted on a seven foot wide by 12 foot long by six foot high brick round top arch. 
this is a little hard to imagine that you're in the house and going through, I'm sorry. <laughs> if one looks close, you will see that the near, <coughs> near, rear wall of this arch is stone and it was probably the black back foundation of the house prior to the 1754 renovations. The date of this brickwork was verified by Richard Irons, our main mason, who maintains many of the colonial homes, including the Paul Revere House in Boston, the town of the House of Seven Gables in Salem, as well as the Dane Winthrop House. As a side note, when I showed him the two brick homes on Siren Street at the point, the 1753 Sturgis Reed House and the 1756 Robert Hancock House, he said that he felt that they had been constructed by the same individual that had built our 1754 chimney structure based on bricks used and the workmanship technique and the craftsmanship used uh, for that season involved. Also during the same renovation period, the previously mentioned dormer windows were removed and a large attached bar was attached to the rear to the eastern uh, corner of the house. Photographs of the house show this barn up to about 1900 when it was apparently dismantled. When the Winthrop Improvement Historical Association bought the house in 1908, after leasing it for three years, we have taken a number of steps to restore the appearance to a colonial period. We have had the wooden shingles removed from the outside walls and replaced them with wood lap street clapboard siding with old style leveled ends. The asphalt roof shingles have been replaced with the original style wood shingles. As said before, most of what I've talked about has been supported by the recent historic research performed by Professor Abbott J. Cummings of the University of Massachusetts School of Administration. And now we're going to see a whole batch of pictures or maybe we've been watching them already. <laughs> Have been? Yep. Well, you've been watching a lot of pictures of the house that uh, show it at the various times that I've talked about. And uh, that's the story for the history of the house. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming tonight.
uh, at my suggestion, uh, one of the last appearances he had here before he passed away, uh, but he sent this letter explaining that there was a connection between the Winter family and the Isaac Royal family. Uh, I don't want to read the entire letter right now, but it is in his script. It's on his letterhead with a little uh, embossed uh, symbol uh, of his family, uh, his, his family crest. And uh, I think it's something that uh, the association and the members will enjoy. So I want to hand this over to Michael uh, first. So what I did was to put a draft together explaining the connection that this woman had via her 10th grandmother. I mean, this is like Henry Louis Gates, right? I mean, this is <laughs> so I took her handwritten note of all of these people going back 10 generations and the connection that she had directly to them through marriage and you know, other engagements, I should say. Uh, but what I would like to read to you is uh, the thank you card and message that was sent to Tom Bogus, who was a caretaker at the time, and who let her come in, having visited from California for a Christmas holiday on December 26th to tour the house. And she sent this letter some weeks later, along with a copy of a, uh, a paperback book uh, called Winter Woman, uh, which is a novel treatment of Dean Winthrop and that whole history from the standpoint of a woman and married into the family. Anyway, dear Tom, thank you so much for opening the house to us and our family that day after Christmas. It meant so much to me and my family. I'm sending a copy of this story from my 10th great-grandmother, who was the cousin of Dean Winthrop. Inside is the genealogy to show my relationship to the Winthrops, which is this. I hope you enjoy the book, which may be used for the house as you wish. My 10th great-grandmother most likely helped with the babies and took care of any who were sick in the Dean Winthrop House, Linda J. Wright Panic Reno, Golala, California. So I'm going to put this in an appropriate form and get it framed similar to the presentation from John Winthrop Sears uh, for the ongoing collection of the Dean Winthrop House. I have two other things to uh, before we all release you. Uh, this is a sign that was put together by uh, Honan Sign. Uh, this was uh, explaining the trestle which borders the driveway uh, on our west side uh, that was recovered from Belle Isle Marsh. Uh, yours truly happened to discover that with nails and spikes sticking out and what have you. Uh, with some great effort and with some coordination with the DPW, we were able to retain that and use that as a retaining wall for a, an edge that kept washing down and you know doing a number on the driveway. So this explains what the narrow gauge railroad tie was all about. Uh, so I think this sign will at least, you know, probably outlast the timber at some point. So I'd like to also donate this to the association. And thank uh, Matt Honan, our former president, and his uncle Richie Honan for preparing that sign for us. And, and then lastly, I have a, um, a booklet that was celebrating uh, the former United Congregational Church down on Tewksbury Street that uh, describes the history of that wonderful church which no longer exists. This was given to me by Tom Parks who is a photographer here in Winthrop and he happened to come by my office one day and said, hey, I found these copies and I think it's something that you should have. What I found rather intriguing was that the author of this is Pat Brown Pat Brown, who was also a uh, Hall of Fame member in Cooperstown for being participating in Women's League Baseball. So, and she was also a member and a speaker here at the association. So this has some relevance and tie-ins, not only for the history of this particular religious facility here in Winthrop, but also the fact that Pat Brown 
has connections with the association as a member and also a member at Cooperstown. So uh, we want to donate this as it is, uh, two copies to the association. as we come each month to the uh, to monthly dinners. And that is a coin, a celebratory coin for the uh, 300th anniversary of the Dean, Dean Winthrop House. It was a tricentennial. Uh, David may or may not have seen it. I need to get a little more background information from our town historian as to the genesis of that particular coin. And it's about a half dollar size. It is in a, a bronze type of metal. Uh, I had carefully cleaned both sides so we can see it. And I'm going to put it in a frame so we can see both sides as we want to inspect it, and also get some background and explain how that coin came into came to be pressed in, I guess circulated, I don't really know too much more about that, but there may have been multiple coins that previous members had enjoyed back at that celebration. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, you know, we are coming up to the 400th anniversary of the Dean Winthrop House pretty soon, so I hope that's another gift that I can present here at the association. So thank you all very much. I hope you all enjoyed the evening. It's good to see all of you back here again. It's been a long time, but uh, we are back, and we'll see you here um, May 14th on our way to the cemetery and uh, the Strawberry Festival. And thank you so much for coming. And uh, this meeting is. Uh, Remind people about volunteers. Volunteers, we're, we're, we need volunteers. Um, so see Kathy Morse and myself uh, after the meeting, and we do need help with the Strawberry Festival. Um, that's our big event, and there's something fun that I'm sure you could do for us. All right, so uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, thank you, Dave. Seems like old you. times, dinner dates and flowers, just like old times, staying up for hours, making dreams come true, doing things we used to do, seems like old times, being here with you.